I feel the unsung hero of every painting is usually the background. In some ways, I feel like it could make or break your painting. Sometimes a background can be very simple. It could just be black or a dark, like a Caravaggio painting with a sense of depth and atmosphere. But in my scenario, I wanted this background to be an accurate representation of the hillside of my village. And therefore, I tried to be as detailed as possible. Hello and welcome. My name is Charlembos. I go by Bob and I'm not your typical painter. And in this video, I am going to show you how I painted my detailed background for my recent sheet painting that I finished some time ago. And when I mean detailed, I tried to make it each field almost like a portrait. Anyhow, before I show you the painting process, I'm going to show you the photo of the background that I used in detail, just so you have an idea of some of the obstacles and have an idea how I interpret a photo. And don't worry, during the painting process, I will show those photos again before the painting begins for practically most of the video. Sometimes I feel it's good to show the reference photo of a painting. And one thing to know, I exaggerated the color because in the end, I wanted the illusion of a very bright sunset with a peachy orange sky. Anyhow, let's get to the photos. This is the photo I used, which was actually different from the main photo for the actual sheet. Reason being is, I actually liked the background more. It was more extensive and the tree was visible. There's definitely a lot of little details in this background that I tried to capture, but something I wanted to establish is a sense of scale. So if you look at these trees, this one here is the closest to the viewing plane. And then you got more here and a few far in the distance. The way they appear smaller and smaller as they go into the distance helps establish a sense of scale of the overall landscape. Also, the fields are not just a solid green. There's a lot going on and there's lots of contours and curvature. I tried to highlight some of those curves with red and when trying to depict them in the painting, it'll come down to a lot of minute details such as the gradual change of colors and just line work. That way you can visually shape the landmass and show each bend and curve that you see. Also to give you the idea of the level of accuracy I was going for, I even included these little trees, which I circled in this photo right here. I also encountered some very complex sections. For example, this area right here doesn't seem like much, but there are so many curves and bends among this landscape. These red lines again illustrate some of the curvature. And as I painted, I analyzed the photo very carefully and zoomed in in certain areas to see if I could depict each bend and contour of the landscape as accurately as possible. I used tricks such as blurring sections, adding highlights in others, and it also came down to gradual changes of color. And for the most part, there wasn't much of a straight line in the entire landscape. And I tried to emphasize this with this red line. I paid attention to the way the crops flowed on the field. Most of them were on the vertical side, but there were some that were on the horizontal side where they went left and right. The portrayal of these fields in that kind of way helped define the landscape as well. And then also, there were certain plants that stood out among the field, and I tried to define them as best as I could by using lights and darks in specific areas, like darks on the bottom and highlights on the top. And then there were certain areas of the field that didn't have much plants and were mostly dirt. And for those sections, I paid attention to the color changes of the fields. It would be light and dark for the dirt. It's probably the way the field was dug, but those little details I felt added to the realism. And as for trees, the level of detail also helped with scale. The one tree I have up close in the viewing plane is definitely the most detailed, but there were some in the middle ground that showed branches and little highlights of leaves. Something I do not show in the painting are the trees in the distance and those I saved when I finished the painting and did the sky. Painting them into the wet paint made them dissolve in the distance. 
Anyhow, let's begin with the painting process. Before going into detail, I always start with an underpainting. The idea is to get simple shapes and bodies of color in the right area in order to establish the composition. In this stage, I'm more focused in placing the fields and specific landmarks in the right spot. Detail will come later, but that does not mean I do not pay attention to the different colors and distinguishable features of the field and the hills in the back. Some simple lines and different variations of the same color will in some ways act as a roadmap later when you go back into the background and start detailing things like trees, bushes, and rows of crops. But for now, it is just the underpainting. During this time, I'm also making corrections. Whether it's the perspective of the field, specific trees, or specific dips and curves on the hillside that are very distinguishable. The goal from the start was to be very accurate depicting the fields of my village, which is also why I used a grid, a simple one though. I treated in some ways sections like a portrait. Once I felt the fields were in the right spot, I started to slowly detail them. For the most part, I focused on each individual field. I paid attention to the different colors and the division among the line of crops. I did not just lay lines. I tried to create the illusion of plants with dots of different sizes and color. I painted them along the contours and perspective of the field and paid attention to all the different colors in each section. A technique that I would use very frequently is dry brushing. After laying out all the colors and line work and dots, I would go back with a dry brush and blur gently everything that I would create. It is very important that you do not put too much pressure. You do not want to ruin the detail, you just want to soften the brushwork that you just laid. This is the background after all, and you don't want it to be as sharp as the foreground. I didn't try to depict every plant in the background, but I tried to get distinguishable features of each field and try to establish a pattern that will mimic the bulk of the area. I worked mostly wet on wet at the beginning because I wanted a soft touch. I used mostly middle tones. I'm saving the darks and the highlights more towards the end, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to include a few here and there, especially if it's to try to establish specific details of that area of the field. This part here was more tricky to paint because there's areas where the soil was visible. Once again, I laid out lines and little patterns of dots in order to, in a way, interpret specific features and details of this part of the field. I looked at the photo very carefully as I painted. Once again, the goal was to, in a way, create a pattern that mimics that particular area, not copy it exactly. After establishing the field with lines, dots, and color, I used a dry brush again in order to soften all the detail. Eventually, towards the end, I will apply even more pattern and line work. It's all about layering. So think about this as the beginning stages after the underpainting. The way I applied the brushwork was pretty much based on the way the crops flowed. Most of the crops in the field were planted from the top of the hill to the bottom. So I used more vertical patterns and lines in order to give the illusion of crops. But in this particular field, they are horizontal. But the process is the same, lay out the lines and pattern and dots of color and then run a dry brush very softly to blur everything and then repeat sometimes as much as two to three more times until it looks just right it's all about the layering and it helps establish a sense of depth with the texture of the plants on the hills i also paid attention to the different variations of greens one very important note is that they do not match 100% of the photo and this was very intentional. I wanted to create the illusion of a sudden sun under a peachy orange sky. Therefore, I tried to make the greens more warmer. But something I did that helped with the realism of the fields were the imperfections. What I mean by that are some stray plants some of the crops not in a perfect line, and there's also some pathways among the crops that look man-made from constant walking. It is these little imperfections and details that add to the overall realism 
of the field. In order not to get lost while painting these fields, one of the strategies I used was to paint specific details that stood out among the rest. Stuff like dark sections of the field, some highlights that stood out, or areas that there's patches of earth visible with no plants. These would act as guides as I paint the rows of plants in the fields. Even though I'm trying to just mimic the pattern of the fields and texture as well, but at the same time, I'm trying to make them representational, just like a portrait. I wanted people who were familiar with the area to be able to identify some of the smaller details and which specific fields they were. I'm going to talk a lot about dry brushing throughout the whole video, especially in order to get soft edges and to soften detail and give certain sections a blurry look. But if there's an area that could benefit from a soft touch, it's definitely things in the very, very distance. Since the sky meets this area with the rest of the landscape, I applied some paint that mimics the brightness of the sun in that area and I actually painted the mountains directly into it and used a dry brush whilst the paint was still wet to soften the edges a little bit more as well. Same thing with the trees that are underneath the sun. I applied lots of different patterns of color to mimic the illusion of trees. I paid attention to the color temperature as well. The greens I used were definitely on the brighter and warmer tone, minus the parts that were in the shade or not in sunlight. In this scenario, it wasn't too much about getting every tree I saw, but given the illusion that they're all bunched together with variations of certain ones sticking out here and there. None of the fields were a solid color. All of them had a lot of variation. Some had more plants, others had less. And based on that, the texture would appear different. In this section at the far right, it appears that there's quite a bit of earth visible. So besides just laying out greens, I also painted the earth. When also painting the visible earth in some of the fields, it is important to note, the terrain is not flat all the time. There are crevices, pathways, and mounds of dirt that you have to portray. And lights and darks, plus cool and warm tones help shape out those imperfections and distinguishable features in the fields. While the paint was still wet, I started to paint the visible plants. Again, wet on wet paint helps get that softer look of things in the distance where the edges and detail are soft and blurred. And of course, I would finalize it with dry brushing. I applied some darker tones of green to the plants that were visibly grounded, more towards the bottom where they would connect to the earth, and some lighter tones on the top. The idea was to create the illusion of a terrain that one had some earth visible, two, there were some rounded plants that stood out, and three, they were in some sort of rows, not perfect ones, if anything, some were definitely really off, so in a way, it was not just random brushwork to do the fields. This particular section definitely did not have a lot of plants at all, but the rows were very clearly visible among the earth. And in this scenario, they're pretty straight too, but there was a dip and curves in. Hard to explain, but let's just say the hill was not perfectly flat and did not roll down at a perfect curvature. And while I tried to paint that section, I used lights and darks to try to distinguish where the dip was. Plus the lines of the rows help establish the contours as well. Once again, while the paint was wet, I also painted the plants, even though they were scarce. Funny thing, the section next to it was less barren and more full of crops. But I still tried to use lights and darks, plus a little bit of pattern to portray the curvature of that hill. Here's another section where there's mostly dirt visible. Again, I laid out nice bodies of color, not a solid one, as I was trying to get the division of the plants. In this scenario, it's the tone of the earth under the sun. And then while the paint was wet, I started applying lines of the plants and crops while also paying attention to particular details that stood out among that field. Sometimes between the patches of earth and other times directly on the wet paint. It all depended how hard or soft I wanted the edges to be. Some of the plants definitely stood out more than others. 
And then of course, some dry brushing to soften some of the edges and details. As I was painting the hills further in the back, I was still mindful of some detail, especially things such as the trees, rows of crops, and some distinguishable features of the field. But everything was done with a softer touch in order to push those hills further into the back and create an illusion of depth and distance. One of the hardest sections for me to paint was where the trees were in the center. I believe I redid this section quite a few times and unfortunately didn't film quite a bit of the process. I was doing a lot of trial and error. It was quite possibly the challenge of having the right amount of detail and using lights and darks in order to create the illusion of lots of trees in the distance. What I did is I applied all the colors I saw and little details with tiny brushes and tried to give form to some of the trees and make some stand out. Once I felt I got the right colors in the right spot, I would go over everything with a dry brush again. Besides the mountains and hills in the distance, these trees were further in the viewing plane than almost everything else. So they require definitely a soft touch. But at the same time, the illusion that there's actually trees. There were also areas that were more cooler, particularly the areas that the sun was not hidden and shadows were being casted. I looked at the photo very carefully in order to sculpt these trees. By using lights and darks, as well as cool and warm tones, you could shape out an area even in the distance and give a sense of form and volume to what would have been just dabs of paint. So my recommendation whenever looking at photos of trees or bushes or just about anything else for that matter, try to interpret it as a 3D object or mass, not a 2D caricature and shape it with lights and darks as well as cool and warm tone colors. Paint like a sculptor in a way, where you're carving out trees and hills out of the landscape. There was a tree line between the two sets of fields among the hills. This was an area of interest, believe it or not. Besides trying to be accurate with the placement of the trees, as well as detail in them, they served as a purpose to help establish a sense of scale. There is a tree in the foreground, and it is actually very detailed, Little branches and leaves are depicted and they are a lot more sharper, which is the reverse of the ones in the middle ground. And there's also more trees in the distance, and for those, definitely a much more softer touch, with barely any detail visible. Same also goes for the fields that are further back. I tried to detail them, but at the same time, give them a soft touch and give the illusion of depth and distance when compared to the fields that are closer with more sharper refined detail. In this little section of the painting, it appears that there is a dense forest with lots of trees bunched together. In order to capture them in the painting, I used a lot of tiny brushes not to paint each individual tree, but the impression that there's lots of them. It's a series of lights and darks. At the top of the tree, it's going to be definitely brighter. I would use a green that would feature more cadmium yellow. And the sides not facing the sun are definitely going to be on the darker side. I used mostly viridian for the darks, but I would mix it also here and there with either cobalt blue or cadmium orange. But for the true darks, I would use a lizard crimson. The process involved constantly building layer after layer of color in almost an impressionistic style. It was quite challenging to do this section because I was trying to get a balance of detail and also the softness because the area was in the distance. After laying out bodies of color and brushwork that resembled trees in the distance, again I would use a dry brush to soften the detail. I'll be honest, this part was difficult and not totally true to the photo. In the end, I was just happy I had the impression of a forest in the distance. As I did this section of the dense forest, I paid very close attention to the edges of each tree and to an extent I exaggerated the lights and darks. Like before, I used tiny brushes and builded this area brush stroke after brush stroke in order to give the impression of leaves and branches among those trees. I did use a little bit of titanium white for the highlights, but it was made with a mixture of viridian and cadmium yellow. As for the darks, 
I used almost pure viridian with alizarin crimson again. That would be the base coat for the really dark spots, but I would use a very pale green with a bit of viridian cobalt blue and a tad of titanium white to get some of the little details of leaves and branches on the dark parts of the tree. I try to take advantage of this while the paint is wet. That way, as I do the brushwork, I get a nice very soft touch and soft edges. As for the middle tones, I would use cadmium orange with the viridian to give the green a warm tone. This color would, in a way, intertwine with the lights and darks. I would definitely use a dry brush towards the end again to soften them even more and help push the trees into the distance. I'm a big fan of layering and building up sections very slowly, sometimes with just lots of little brushwork. Same goes for when I did the fields. Each one had at least possibly three rounds. The first was the underpainting, the second was the middle tones and getting some of the details in the right spot, and the last round and layer involves the finesse and final touches, but most importantly, getting the extreme darks and the highlights. As I'm doing this section, I'm being mindful of the tree that's in the foreground. At the moment, it is just the framework or skeleton of the tree, which is the branches and trunk. This was just the beginning stages of the tree. I did it intentionally so I could focus on painting the background first. In this scenario, the field that's right behind it. I'm not too concerned if I overlap the branches, but I make sure they're somewhat visible. When the field is done, later I will go back and do the tree, which I have a video about in case you're interested. It is called how to paint trees in a landscape. I'll have a link in the description. But the important thing is to do the background first before doing the tree that's in front of it. Same thing for this tree in the distance. I definitely did the background first, but I had to go back into the forest that was behind it and cool down some of the trees so it could stand out. I applied warm tones such as cadmium, yellow, and orange into that tree to push it forward from the forest. I did try to detail some branches and the trunk, but because this tree is far in the distance, I used a dry brush to in a way soften all the brushwork, so it's also still pushed back, but the cool tones in the forest behind it is even more pushed back. I even used cool tones for the field that's in front of the tree. This is the first painting I actually started to use cobalt green, and I used it as an alternative to white to cool and push certain parts of the field back, such as the far end of this field. I would later use it also to cool down parts of the field behind the tree in the foreground. In a way, I took advantage of the properties of warm and cool tones when it comes to trying to push something forward or push something back. That's why I also applied more warm tones for the green of the field that comes more closer to the foreground. But for sure, I definitely applied those tones in a very strategic way. Like the rest of the fields, I paid very close attention to the photo. I believe I also counted the amount of rows of crops. Not all of them, but specific ones that stood out because they were either very bright from the highlights of the sun or also very dark. I also used texture to create an illusion of depth. That is why the brushwork at the far end of this field is on the softer side and very blurry. But as I got closer and closer to the foreground, besides applying more warm tones, I increased the visible texture in the field and paid attention to more of the little details. Also some of the rows of crops are not exactly straight and curve at a certain point, especially at the edges and corners. These little bits of imperfections add to the overall realism because in a way, sometimes nothing is perfect. Kinda how like some of the crops from this one field spread into the other and in a way they are out of bounds from the field they are intended to be grown in. At this point of the painting, I am working left to right for the most part. In this section, I'm trying to go back into some of the trees and detail them a little further. But the other little detail I'm trying to do that is not that much noticeable is soften the edge of the top of the hill where the trees meet. Since the top of the hill is more into the distance, it makes sense to use soft edges and brushwork. I took advantage of the trees being wet in order to paint the illusion of some grass blending in with them where they meet with the hill. 
this was definitely a very interesting area to paint. The contours of this hill were definitely tricky to depict, but I started to add highlights and some darks to help define the curvature of the hill. Once again, the way the crops line up also helps shape out the form of the terrain. I was very careful painting the area where the hill dips a little and even exaggerated one of the highlights where the hill begins to bend in a little. A little side note, those little trees on the far left that are very tiny, they're pretty accurately depicted on where they should be. I feel these little details help with the overall realism. Once again, I'm back at it at painting the trees in the middle of the painting. I felt the field behind them was already pretty complete, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to further touch up the field. So it made sense to do the trees next. Besides focusing on further detail in them, I added more highlights, particularly around the edges of the trees, but I added them as if I was doing the impression of leaves. And in some sections, I did the reverse. I lightened the field behind the trees and then darkened some features of the trees in order for them to stand out in front of the field. The goal was to make them stand out further from the field they are in front of. Also like before, I also softened the edge of the field where the trees meet the hill. If you notice, most of the trunks are not visible and are hiding behind where the hill dips and curves in. Besides adding lights and darks to either the field or the trees, once again I started to focus on little details as well. I paid very close attention to the photo to try to spot things such as branches and trunks for the trees and some of the individual crops that stood out in the fields. Once again, some light dry brushing was used in order to soften some of the detail. Another key emphasis was to continue to define the curvature and contours of the field and I did that by using in line work, color, as well as lights and darks. Sometimes it's the most minute little details that help shape the terrain. That is why I always consider painting almost like sculpted. You're trying to, in a way, create shapes and forms on a 2D surface. An area that I want to point out that might go overlooked is the top of the hill where the trees are. It's not a perfect straight line and I paid very close attention depicting the curvature as well as heavily blurring the detail at the very top with a dry brush and also adding highlights. And lastly, as mentioned before, while the paint of the trees is still wet, to kind of blend in some individual grass blades very tiny ones. I'm doing this while the paint is still wet because it's easier to get those soft edges. There's a few reasons why I spent quite a deal of time detailing the trees in the middle ground. Besides showing a sense of depth and distance, it was also for a sense of scale, especially since there's a tree in the foreground to compare everything to. But I had to be careful with the amount of detail that went into them. Think of it as a balance of detail. Not too much and not too little. When compared to the tree that's in the foreground, as well as all the ones in the distance, but at the same time, give them more form than the ones that are further in the back, underneath the sun, or all the way on the top of the hills. I also tried to treat them kind of like portraiture as well, because my thought was that some of the villagers will be able to identify the trees. So I paid attention to things like branches, size, and the overall placement of where they are on the field. When it came to finishing the fields, the goal was to continue building onto the layers of paint and to start adding more definition and defining some of the rows of crops as well as the texture of the field. In order to do that, I paid attention to some of the darks as well as the highlights and every possible variation of green that I saw, or other colors for that matter. Like before, I did not copy the field exactly as I saw it, but I did try to get key features that I saw that stood out, and then came up with a pattern of dots and lines in order to mimic the field. I still did use a dry brush here and there to soften the detail, but I was a little more selective towards the end. In some of the areas, particularly the highlights, I would try to make them a little more sharper and in ways give the plants definition on a large scale. Something important that I do not mention is to stop what you're doing once in a while and take a look from a distance. 
I would have to do this here and there while working on the fields because this whole time I'm so close to the canvas and in the end you have to look at the overall picture. For this painting there were lots of different fields competing with each other but in the end I had to make sure that they receded because in the end the sheep are the stars of the painting not the fields but the fields do play a very important role because the goal was to capture the sunlight from a setting sun and I always felt that the photo never showed the orange glow I saw. So in a ways, the way I depicted the background and exaggerating the brightness of the field, it helped increase the sense of light in the overall painting. Therefore, it was necessary to step back and look once in a while. I'm gonna wrap up this video by summarizing everything. The first stage of doing the background is definitely the underpainting. It's always good to lay out bodies of color that shape out everything and plant things in the right area. For me, it was the fields and trees and bushes here and there. Getting the underpainting correct is very important before you go into detail. You could always correct little things as you're doing the painting, but definitely work out the major issues early on. After that, it's time to start building on. For me, since I was painting fields, I had to paint the impression that there's lots of crops in the field. But since this is the background, I have to keep in mind that everything needs to recede. So instead of using sharper edges, I tried to take advantage of the paint being wet on many different occasions. Because when you paint directly into wet paint, you get softer brush strokes and with that in mind, I would dry brush quite frequently in the early stages in order to soften everything and then build on top of that with more and more layers of paint. Something I would repeat consistently until I got the field looking just right. And then towards the very end, I would focus on the extreme darks and the extreme lights and try to define the fields and give them a sense of texture. But again, not too detailed and mostly on the softer side. But when it came to some of the highlights, I would try to keep them sharp because they need to stick out. And the further and further you go into the background, things should get more softer and even more blurry. And in some scenarios, vanish into the horizon. Something I did not show in this video is painting the trees in the far distance and that's because I wanted to start doing them when I was painting the sky. The reason is because while the paint is wet, I could just give off a soft impression that there's trees there so they're even further pushed back into the distance. If you made it to the end, thanks for watching. Hopefully this video was helpful on having an idea on how to paint a very detailed background. It doesn't have to be as complex as the one I've done, or it could be more complex for that matter. But just remember, a very good background will complement the subject matter in the end, which was the sheep in my painting, as well as the overall sense of sunlight coming from a setting sun. For more of my work, check out my Instagram. Not your typical painter, of course. Anyhow, thanks for watching. Until next time, bye.